The Bible is composed of 66 individual books written over a period of about 1,500 years by about 40 different human authors. It ranges from books of history to books of poetry to books of prophecy to letters and discusses a time from the creation of the world to around the end of the first century A.D., you know, you step back and you just look about, look at the Bible and you see it's clearly no ordinary book. Certainly it claims and then even demonstrates that it really is the book from God. 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17 claims that the scripture is inspired or breathed out by God. And certainly it backs up that claim. The story of the Bible, if you, if you really step back and you just look at the pages of the scriptures, Think about what is it really about? Well, it is the story of God's eternal plan. And it is the greatest story that's ever told. You know, you think about all the great stories. The Bible is the greatest of all. It is the true story about how God saves people, including you and including me, from the greatest enemies we have ever faced. So in this lesson, throughout this series, what we want to do is just kind of overview God's eternal plan, what the Bible's really about, and how God's plan unfolds throughout the Bible's story. But in this lesson, we want to just consider the beginning of this eternal plan and the Bible story. So let's get started thinking about the Bible story in the beginning. First, let's recognize that in the beginning, God was. You know, as the Bible opens and begins to discuss the creation of this universe, as it does in Genesis chapter 1, we find out in verse 1 that God was already there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's interesting, right? The Bible doesn't begin by explaining in any way the existence of God, except to say that God's already there. Certainly, God was. And in fact, as you think about who is this God, well, the Bible reveals him throughout the pages of the Scriptures. For example, the Bible demonstrates that this God has some characteristics that nobody else has. Particularly, this God is eternal. This God always existed and never needed a creator. Now, that's hard for us to imagine, but it is certainly demonstrated in the Scriptures. This is exactly who this God is. Revelation 4 and in verse 8, the pictures, the scene of of the throne room of heaven in Revelation 4 and verse 8, here are these four living creatures, and notice what they're saying. Notice what they're doing. It says, day and night they never stop, saying, holy, 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 Lord God the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And so this God who was in the beginning. It does this this passage is showing us it doesn't matter where you go on a timeline. God's always there. He always was, he is today, and he will always be. In fact, God exists outside of a timeline. Before time even began, God was. And long after time ends here upon this earth, God will be. He is to come. Genesis chapter 21 and verse 33 shows us how Abraham called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. So he will exist into eternity. Psalm 90 and verse 2 says, Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity, you are God. So God is infinite in both directions of, of time. Always existing and always will exist. 
So in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, as we'll talk about more in just a little while, God was. And he always will be. But another characteristic that we see about this God possessing is that this God is all-powerful. That is, he has no limitation to his power. You can see that as we think about some things in Genesis chapter 1 regarding the creation of the world, where you step back and you think about how could this world come into existence? How could the universe come into existence? All of the marvelous things that we can see around us and how they function and all of such things. Well, it took an all-powerful creator. Genesis chapter 17 and in verse 1 Concerning how God was promising Abraham, even when he was very old, a son, saying, I am God Almighty. He's Almighty. He can do whatever he wills. Revelation 19 and verse 6, Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters, and like the rumbling of loud thunder saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. So God is eternal, and he has limitless power. But another characteristic about this God who has always been and will always be is that He, there is nothing he cannot know. He is all-knowing. Isaiah chapter 46 pictures this in verses 9 and 10. God says, remember what happened long ago, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and no one is like me. I declare the end from the beginning, and from long ago what is not yet done, saying, my plan will take place, and I will do all my will. God's will is will be done. God knows things even from long before, before they begin. Remember that as we keep going through this particular lesson, we'll come back and see some of that. But God has such knowledge that he knows what's going to happen. He knows everything. Romans 11 verses 33 through 36 praises God, saying, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? And who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. God's unsearchable riches. He knows far beyond what anyone else could ever know. He is all-knowing. And another characteristic I want to draw your attention to is, of course, that that God then is ever-present. There's nothing that escapes his attention anywhere in the whole universe and the spiritual realm. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, observing the wicked and the good. In Psalm 139, you can read verses 3 through 12. Verse 7 just kind of summarizes what's going on here. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? And the answer that's given throughout this psalm is nowhere. No matter where you go, God sees, God his, you can't escape him and his attention. So he is eternal, he is all-powerful, he is all-knowing, and he is ever-present. Now, as you think about this God who was in the beginning, three separate beings possess the nature of being God, according to the scriptures. That, that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Often call that the Trinity. And these three have the same nature of being God. They have all those characteristics we've just talked about, but they're one God as they are fully united as God. You read like John 1 verses 1 to 3, we can see that Jesus 
is God. Acts 5 verses 3 through 4 shows us the Holy Spirit is God. Genesis 1 and verse 2 shows us the presence of the Holy Spirit there in creation. Genesis 1 verses 26 and 27 talks about how God made man in our image, he says. And so we see that that the Trinity is present throughout Scripture, but yet they are separate beings. Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17 shows all three at one time. The same thing in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. So, in the beginning, God was. But now, as we think about the beginning, we need to recognize that in the beginning, God had a plan. This God had a plan to redeem mankind from sin that is eternal in nature. How could God do that? Well, remember this characteristics that not only was he eternal, but he had limitless knowledge of what would happen. And so he had a plan in place to redeem mankind from sin. Look at some passages that speak about this plan. In Matthew 25 and verse 34, Concerning the judgment day, it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So from the foundation of the world, this kingdom had been prepared. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, talking about Jesus, how he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge. But yet the Jews had used lawless na- uh, people to nail him to a cross and kill him. In Acts 3, in verse 18, in this way God fulfilled what he had predicted through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. We'll see some of that as we keep going through this series. But God made prophecies about this plan. Romans 16, verse 25, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation about Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept silent for long ages. So there was a mystery that existed for long ages. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. Ephesians 1, verse 4, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 11 says, This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ and to shed light for all about the administration of the, hidden, of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church, to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. This is according to his eternal purpose, accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So his purpose accomplished in Christ that we'll be talking about was an eternal purpose. 2 Timothy 1, verses 8 and 9, So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, Share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, it says, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times 
for you. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Again, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. So what we see in all of these passages is that even before God created this world or people sinned, God had a plan that would offer eternal salvation through Jesus. It was eternally in the mind of God. However, you know, this plan was once considered to be a mystery, as we see in some of these scriptures, as it really it was not fully understood in the Old Testament times, as it can be understood today. You know, we're going to look at different passages, like in Genesis 3 and verse 15, that we'll look at here in just a little while. And you think about as, Jesus, as, as God makes statements concerning how he was going to punish Satan in that passage. It's doubtful that Adam and Eve, if they were hearing that, understood what that was going to be, how God was going to fulfill that. Or the same way with Abraham in Genesis 12 and verse 3, when Abraham is promised that through his seed all peoples of the earth will be blessed. Does it, Abraham probably doesn't understand what that, what that looks like. It was a mystery. They just got little pieces. First Peter chapter 1 kind of talks about this in verses 10 through 12, saying, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or what circumstances the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. These things have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. And you just think about the power of that. That this idea that all of this had been prophesied and the prophets wanted to know what these things meant, what this was going to look like. But they couldn't know that. This was instead for you and I. Today, we need to appreciate that we can now know the mystery that has been revealed and that you can partake of it. Ephesians 3, verses 3 through 6 says, The mystery was made known to me by revelation, Paul says. As I have briefly written above, by reading this, you are able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. This was not made known to people in other generations as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This mystery is now able to be known. So in the beginning God was, and God had a plan. And now we come to the beginning of this Bible story, when God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 1, as we have read. Genesis chapter 1 records God's six-day creation of the heavens and the earth and everything therein. And I would encourage you just to go and read through the Genesis account of creation. As he created light on day one, and he created the firmament or the sky, the separation between the waters above and waters below on day two, and he created dry land and seas and um, separating them and and. Um, creating the grass and herbs and trees and so forth on day three, creating the sun, moon, and stars on day four. Um, and, and, and then in verse uh, and, uh, day five, creating the uh, sea creatures and the birds. And then in day six, creating the land animals and ultimately people. 
And so we see all of God's creation as you go through that chapter. And in this, it's important to recognize the special way that God created you and I in in His image. That is, He created us as spiritual beings who can worship and serve God and, and who survive physical death. Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God, a very special way that God created us. Remember, God is spirit. John 4, verse 24 tells us that. And so God creating people in his image indicates to us that he created us with, as a spiritual being. Well, after creating the heavens and the earth and everything therein, God then declared everything was very good. Genesis 1 and verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Well, since God is entirely good and cannot have fellowship with sin, as you see in passages like 1 John 1 and verse 5, God's light, there's no darkness in him. And as we saw in Revelation 4 and verse 8, with the idea that he's holy, well, then that means that God created a world that was free from sin. And God placed man in the Garden of Eden which was a true paradise on earth. And you can read about it in Genesis 2, verses 8 through 14. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he placed the man he had formed. The Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for food, including the tree of life, in the middle of the garden, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river went out from Eden to water the garden. From there it was divided and became the source of four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, which flows through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Gold from that land is pure. Bedellium and onyx are there, also there. The name of the second river is Gihon, which flows to the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which runs east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And you look at how God, the place God prepared for these people that God created as he put the man there and then he created the woman for the man in Genesis 2 verses 18 through 25. And this is the way he created the world. And at this point, everything was perfect. However, I want you to pause as you think about how God created all of this. And think about why did the all-powerful and eternal God, why did he create the heavens and the earth? Why did he create them in the way that he did? Why did he create people in his image and with free will? Look at a few passages with me to consider the answer to that question. Psalm 19 and verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the works of His hands. In Psalm 57 and verse 5, God, be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over the whole earth. In Psalm 8, it says, Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you set in place. What is a human being that you remember him, a son of man that you look after him? You made him little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. 
You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. All the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. In Isaiah 43, in verse 7, it says, Everyone who bears my name and is created for my glory, I have formed them, indeed, I have made them. Ecclesiastes 12 tells us in verses 13 and 14, When all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this, Fear God and keep his commands, because this is for all humanity. For God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. And then one more in Acts 17, verses 26 and 27. It says, From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God. And perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So why? Did God do all of this? Why did God create the universe as large as he did and as marvelous as he did and this this earth? And why did he create uh, people in his image and with free will? God did this so that all creation would glorify him. Particularly, God expects those who have been created in his image to choose to glorify and seek him. But, even though this is how God created the heavens and the earth, what we read about then is the fall. When God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the Garden of Eden, he gave them a law to follow. Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17 says, The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, the law and the consequences for breaking the law were both plainly identified. Don't eat from this tree or you're going to die. However, Satan enters the Bible story in Genesis chapter 3, and he works through the serpent to tempt Eve. Look at Genesis 3 and verses 1 through 5. It says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, You must not eat it or touch it, or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So here is Satan appealing to the physical desires of the woman and makes breaking the law of God sound like a good idea. And tragically, Eve was deceived by Satan. She looked at the tree differently after the temptation and chose to violate God's law, that is, to sin. Look at verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. So sin is now in the world. As she has given in to the temptation and then passed that on to her husband, who also sinned against God, violating God's law. Well, spiritual death, that is separation from God, occurred on this day. Their relationship with God was changed. 
and physical death and suffering also entered the world at that time. You can go on and read in Genesis 3, verse 16 through 24 of some of the consequences. And then Adam is recorded as having died in chapter 5 and verse 5. But finally, before we move on from this point, God also punished the serpent and Satan. And I made reference to these verses a little while ago in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. It says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And so this passage is showing us, this, this passage records, I believe, the first glimpse into God's eternal plan to save mankind from sin, as it foreshadows all that would be accomplished through Jesus defeating Satan, that Satan would score a, a temporary victory against Jesus, like striking, like a serpent that strikes a person's heel. But Jesus was going to, who was the seed of the woman, who was going to provide a crushing blow to Satan through what he would accomplish, like a person crushing the head of a serpent. But one more thing, why is sin such a big deal? We need to appreciate the problem of sin before we go on throughout this series of lessons. Genesis goes on to detail how sin spread quickly as people multiplied on this earth. It wasn't just Adam and Eve. Later, one of their children, by the name of Cain, murdered his brother Abel, as you go into Genesis 4, verses 6 through 8. And then in Genesis chapter 6, we see the widespread effects of sin. It says that in Genesis 6, verses 5 through 8, when the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and he was deeply grieved. Then the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I created off the face of the earth, together with the animals, creatures that crawl, and birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. Noah, however, found favor with the Lord. So sin kept on spreading. Sin is the violation of God's law, just kept on spreading. And this has continued today. You can read in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, just a little sample of that text says there is no, no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. Verse 23 simply says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But why is sin such a big deal to God? Why is it that God needed an eternal plan to deal with sin? We've got to appreciate that to appreciate his plan. First, sin is the transgression of God's law. As people violate God's laws, 1 John 3 and verse 4, everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin is violating what the God of the universe says. Second, since God is entirely holy and pure, sin separates people from God. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, just as it did with Adam and Eve. Indeed, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save, and his ear is not too deaf to hear. But your iniquities are separating you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not listen. You could also see this in 1 John 1, verses 5 through 7. Third, 
sin results in the, etern- the punishment of eternal death in hellfire. Romans 6 and verse 23 tells us the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But what we deserve for sinning is spiritual death, separation from God and eternal separation from God, as is pictured in Revelation 21 and in verse 8. But the cowards, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Eternity in hell is waiting for those who die in their sins. And fourth, because sin is such a big deal, because those who sin deserve to spend eternity in hell. And so it follows that people could not do anything to earn their own salvation and were desperately in need of a Savior. Again, the wages of sin is death. That is what we have earned. That is what we deserve. And we cannot undo it by ourselves. We needed an answer. We needed a Savior, as this passage points us to, as does Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, that we couldn't get there by ourselves. We couldn't get out of this mess of sin that we have all chosen by ourselves. So, God created the universe and the world and everything in them in a perfect way. Yet, people chose to sin against God which brought many consequences. And with these foundational points established that we have seen in this lesson, the stage is now set for the unfolding of God's eternal plan. How would God respond to the problem of sin? Well, in the next lesson, we'll see how God used the nation of Israel as a key piece in accomplishing His eternal plan of redemption.